Hello again. Well, a group of over 200 scientists is warning that COVID-19 could be airborne. They claim there's evidence the virus and smaller particles in the air can infect people. Well, the World Health Organization says it's looking into these findings, but maintains the virus spreads through contact with droplets. Let's uh, find out more now from Adrian Purin from the National Institute for Communicable Diseases. Adrian, good morning. And I suppose a lot of panic over this uh, information emerging. Well, how credible it is, we don't know. How true it is, because there's lots we don't know about about COVID-19. So what's your thinking, what's your feeling on, on, on this latest information? And of course, the, what we're always talking about is the, the mutations involved when it comes to dealing with this pandemic. Yeah, so I think we can do, deal with this particular topic in two, way, in two separate uh, matters. I think the one is the really around the controversy around um, aerosol spread um, with regard to, to COVID. As we do know, um, this virus has a high level of transmission and we've got these uh, different reproductive numbers, as it were. And it's thought that aerosolization uh, of viruses um, certainly does occur, and it's recognized, and that it certainly would likely apply to um, COVID uh, as, as well. I think the implications are coming back to that other controversy that the WHO was involved in, and that's with regard to the wearing of masks. As you know, um, it took them a while to come around to that particular view that masks were, were certainly uh, critical as well in terms of the prevention, it's, it certainly is not the major role, but certainly would certainly contribute um, to the prevention transmission. However, the, the idea around aerosolization obviously has implications around the wearing of masks, because you will have to then have to have specific masks that prevent, for example, even smaller droplets from being transmitted. So again, if you're thinking of actual speaking to singing mm. um, and, and so forth, then if there are aerosolization that does occur that contains virus, then in fact those particular hand masks, handmade masks, for example, may not always be uh, appropriate. So to what extent then does it actually contribute yeah. to the prevention of transmission? So I think that's the complexity yeah. around of these particular discussions because it will actually have implications not only for day-to-day -day events, but for example in your car, um, in the aeroplane, you know, how do you manage um, aerosolization? And prevention of, of transmission. Well, I suppose, yes, and then that is why uh, certain scientists now are calling on the WHO to revise recommendations on how we actually deal with it. So in the meantime, Adrian, while we don't know, to your mind, what would be the, the best thing to do to protect yourself at the moment? Just keep going as we have been? Yes, I, I think it's that uh, phrase that we used um, when we started talking about the wearing of, of masks is that precautionary principle, in other words. So I think we still keep, well, the science may not always be clear, um, we will certainly keep to the physical distancing, um, the hand hygiene, and the wearing of masks, the cough etiquette. Those are still the key things that I think will certainly be um, important for us to, to continue to do to try and, and limit um, transmission. So if this is indeed the case and is found to be true, then, you know, would this make it, um, the, the, the word out there is that it is more infectious but less deadly. How would that be possible? If it, would it make it less deadly? I would think it makes it even deadlier then. Um, it certainly will obviously contribute if we're th thinking along those lines. And as you know, um, we've certainly been talking about the types of masks that you'll have to wear. And so the idea behind WHO's uh, reluctance around the wearing of masks was exactly that point about access to PPE. So again, if we're saying that aerosolization is, is a critical problem, then in fact that may have implications for the types of masks that we would have to wear. And that comes back to the debate around the N95 masks, for example. So I think the, the caution is that we, we continue to do this, um, but that in fact we have to acknowledge, um, and we've seen this in the outbreaks, for example, is that we already are not adhering to even the basics around physical distancing, um, hand hygiene, and, and so forth. So we certainly are already in that particular state, but it's really reinforcing those particular ideas that they still will certainly play a contributory role in terms of preventing transmission. Mm, so I don't think it's a matter of deadly. I think it's a matter of um, the actual control of, of, of transmission. I think the idea of deadly, I think, comes back to the idea of the actual virus in and of itself. Mm. And I think there's, that's the other controversy is around the mutations that are being observed, especially around the spike protein, um, which, and as you know, that the spike protein is a key uh, molecule for the vaccine trials. And so, again, if there are mutations in that region, will it play a significant role around um, transmission? And I think the evidence is still out, in other words. I think more still yeah. needs to be done. There is some association with regard to 
higher viral loads, for example, but we don't always get a sense that the neutralization, which is the key part in terms of transmission, has actually been lost. So I think there needs still, this paper certainly, um, it's a separate paper from Betty Korber, and she did recognize the changes in this particular virus as certainly becoming dominant. It's the so-called G614 um, amino acid that has changed and has become more, more dominant, but I don't think the evidence at the stage, I know the, the headlines are, if you like, called breathless in terms yeah. of their implications, but I think we, we need to be cautious around yeah. how we interpret those, those particular yeah. results. Which is, which I think is, more needs to be done. And that's why we go, if, if this is true, uh, Adrian, then I suppose, what implications does it actually have yeah, or what absolutely. impact will it have on, on vaccine development if this thing is changing and mutating? And again, the picture of that alien <laughs> comes to mind. If it's doing that all the time, how do we even how, how do we get to that vaccine development yes so so you're quite right i, I saw a, a headline for a, a, pot, a, a virology podcast putting all our spikes in one basket <laughs> so i think that's the risk we run that we just choose a specific protein so one would have to look at other proteins for example and also the point that you raised last week around, it's not just about antibody responses. It's also about T cell responses as well that may play a critical role. And so I think the idea is not just to look at the spike protein alone, but also to look at other proteins. And I think they, they may well be included in vaccines and also to look at the types of cellular responses. It's not just the antibody response that may be critical in terms of controlling the virus, it may well be um, the T cells that also contribute to managing this. So I think there are ways in which we can uh, adopt this the, 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 or change our strategies in order to ensure that we have an effective uh, vaccine. All right, Edwin, once again, thanks so much for uh, bringing us that insight and quelling some of the panic that might be out there at the moment as well.